Hello and welcome to everyone who is joining us for this natural language processing series. You're very welcome to today with which marks our first episode of this six of this eight week um, series. Um, so we're delighted to be delivering this and I'm really excited to have you all here with us. And these sessions will last 60 minutes each week, every Wednesday at the same time. And we are recording all of these sessions as well, and they'll be made available to you on demand on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel. So just keep an eye out for those links. I'll, I'll drop them into where you can access um, the videos during the session. Um, a quick word before we get started today, just on our code of conduct. Um, some of you may have seen this before, but it's just really a reminder to everyone who's joining us today to be respectful and welcoming of everyone and be understanding of any differences that we might see during during the Q&A or in, in through the comments section. Um, and just a reminder that this is an inclusive environment and to be friendly and, um, and patient to everyone throughout. Our speakers for today are Robin Lester and David Griswood, and delighted to be welcome, welcoming them back for another Reactor session. So Robin is a Cloud Solution Architect at Microsoft with um, expertise in machine learning technologies, databases and data warehouses. And David is a partner technology strategist with Microsoft. So really looking forward to this session, which is being co-delivered by them both. So I'll hand over to Robin now to just talk us through a bit about this series and to, to kick us off with today's session. So Robin, I'll just stop sharing my screen and allow you to take over. Thank you. Um, OK, uh, so welcome everybody. Um, so this uh, this first session in, in the series of eight is um, called Romcom or not. Um, and it is effectively what we're going to do is there was a this is part two of, of a rom-com or not. Um, so previously there was one uh, done at the reactor, I think probably about a year or two ago. Um, and so we're now revisiting that idea and doing things a little bit different, which will become clear as as we go through through things. Um, in keeping with the, the film stylings, we've got probably got a few slides here that um, just uh, indulging our love of films. Obviously this is, uh, if I could play Star Wars music, I would. Um, and so what what we're basically saying is there's um there's lots of d data science out there and data science is um is, is is something that people are learning all the time and um things are happening within the data science field where um best practices maybe aren't being used um we, we're seeing models being put out there that are maybe overfitted uh, we're seeing um people not exposing themselves to all different kind of algorithms they could do so really this session today is talking about um problems that there were with the original rom-com or not um machine learning process how we would fix that how we might go around doing machine learning in um uh more of a coming at it more of it from a data science perspective. It's animation, if you see that. Um, right, so, um, so uh, as I said, this is part of an eight part series. So this one is rom-com or not. Uh, next week, I will be talking to you about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, and in that, we'll be um, creating a brand new episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer using machine learning. Um, we'll even present that episode, um, not with actual actors, but with voice, with um, synthesized voice actors, and we'll also uh, be uh, rating that in accordance with um, IMDb, just to see how good our new Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode um, is. Now, obviously, there is a reboot of Buffy the Vampire Slayer now. We kind of came up with this concept before the reboot. Um, but with, yeah, but basically, we're using machine learning to create to um, create text that is. Um, well, you'll, you'll see how good it is or not when you when you come to that session. Um, then we have an overview of Azure NLP solutions, topic modeling uh, with Azure machine learning, um, converting audio files into text with Azure ML, fundamentals of text mining, state-of-the-art language models, question answering apps with Kaggle uh, and Cord. So um, within the series, we try and cover all the all the elements of machine learning um, and give you a kind of firm foundation in the techniques and tools that are available to you to do 
uh, natural language processing. Um, so I'll now pass over to you, David. Thank you, Robin. So how did this all start? Uh, well, I don't mind admitting I'm a bit of a film buff. I enjoy watching movies. I'm interested in the movie business and how it all works. I've been doing a part time film course at Oxford University. And as part of that love of cinema, I've been doing things like uh, regular listening to Kermit Mayo's flagship BBC Five Live uh, film review. And so as a fan of The Good Doctor, when back in summer of 2018, there was a new series announced called Mark Kermode's Secrets of Cinema, which, by the way, is still available on the BBC iPlayer. I thought I, I really loved it. And if you haven't seen the series, in each episode, he takes a particular genre. And the first one was rom-com. And that was indeed the inspiration for this whole original series. And dissects the plot points um, to see what are the common themes that script writers and directors use to make a really successful rom-com and he dissects them and looks at things like the meet cute uh, part of the movie if, if you're not aware of that phrase meet cute is uh, the first meeting often in overly elaborate or stage environment for uh, the love interest who will inevitably fall apart and then eventually overcome hurdles to come back together again and that from a critics review is what the films are about and uh, Phil Harvey and I were having a chat about this because he likes his movies as well and we asked the question that whilst AI right now is not good enough to do what Mark Kermer does in terms of giving us insights into the way a particular genre of film is made we did think that perhaps the way that the movies are created might have common tropes that we might be able to pick up by digesting the scripts from a whole variety of uh, different movies out there and see if we could then, given an arbitrary bit of text, figure out whether it has a more in line with a rom-com or a horror or something like that. And lo and behold, we created the original uh, rom-com project. So uh, as they say with a big hello to Jason Isaacs, let's have the next slide and look at what we did in version one. So this was our first attempt and it was a pretty straightforward one from uh, a machine learning process. What we did is we went out into the internet and grabbed a whole load of movie scripts. They're, most of them seem to be out there and available for research purposes, which is what we were doing here. Uh, and what we did is we went and looked for films about a dozen or so in each of the five genres. And we picked these based on that first series of Secrets of Cinema. So rom-com, horror, heist, comedy and science fiction in there. So this is a supervised learning uh, project. Uh, and we downloaded these. In this first version, we just focused on the spoken word, not the film direction. We'll come back in uh, the latter part of this session and talk about, you know, this very, you know, some of these ideas about how much data do you take and what impact will that have. But we took the spoken word and then we did a little bit of data wrangling and created a single uh, tab separated value file in which we had the movie genre as a number, tab, and then all the script and one long line with the stop words and noise removed. Initially, we use um, one of the cognitive services analytics capability to actually do that analysis, but we actually, after a couple of iterations, discovered actually there was an inbuilt function in ML.NET to do that, so that was one less step to do. And armed with this file, we basically built a multi-classifier model. So we're going to look at the five different genres and classify the script on each of those. And we built it in ML.NET. And then we took the output of that, which is a, a model, and then deployed it as an MVC app to Azure. And um, as a .NET developer myself, I, I was keen to exploit that as a mechanism because there's so many web developers out there who understand MVC apps. So it was really trying to make it very easy for someone with those skills to actually deploy a machine learning model. And then one of my colleagues, Jason, produced a nice little single page app that made a jQuery call. Uh, now, if you want to uh, look at it, it's all open source and there's the URL 
for GitHub if you want to check that out. Um, in those immortal words, next slide, please, Robin. So why did we choose ML.net? Well, uh, several reasons. Firstly, it was new and we were keen to explore it. It's a new open source framework and particularly focused at .NET developers. And that's, that's me. I, unlike Robin, don't have a background in machine learning and data science, but I also know from my work over the years that there are lots of not .NET developers who'd like to get into this world and the idea of having to throw everything they've known and loved in the .NET world and you know learn Python and learn new development tools and languages and techniques is quite a high barrier to getting into the machine learning world so anything that lets me take my skills and start using them straight away has got to be great so I was able to use VS Code I love in .NET and build these models using the architecture and design principles I've spent many years honing um, and we'll explore this in a second ml.net focuses on two aspects of ml firstly the design and training and building of a model and then secondly the deployment of them and for this project uh, we did both and we were able to make a lot of progress with from my perspective relatively limited background in this world and that's because one of the things the ML.NET team have done is chose to focus on the common scenarios on that 80 20 type thing where they're focusing on, you know, the regression testing and the uh, categorization that we're talking about here. They've got samples that cover sentiment analysis and price estimates, the common sort of things that people will want to do. Next slide, please. We're not going to go into ML.NET in any real detail in this session. If you look at the source code for the ROMCOM or not ROMCOM project, uh, you can see all the details. But in talking about the role of ML.NET, it's really useful to appreciate this one diagram here. Is on the left hand side, there's that process I mentioned of, create, uh, of creating, training, and evaluating uh, a model, which is an iterative process. And when you get to the point where you're happy, you deploy that model, which is just a zip file under the cover, and then you can take that zip file and then put it into your DevOps runtime environment, whether that's like a web app, which I did, or functions or a desktop app, and, and run it and make predictions based on the model you've already built. So the hard work is in the creation of the model. The easier bit is just to make simple calls into the model and say, what sort of movie do you predict this is with what degree of confidence? Next slide, please. And here is the meat of the ML.NET work. I'm not expecting you to understand it because this is the one area where you do actually have to spend some cycles getting your head around the way ML.NET works. But even at a high level, you might be able to get a sense of what's happening here. The very first line is, loading that file, that big file, that TSP file that we create with all movies in, into the system as a tabular set of data with two columns. And then we're going to wrangle and, you know, convert the text to numbers because machine learning works in numbers, not in text. So we have to wrangle that, do some mapping and stuff like that. And that middle section defines that. Now, notice that one of the lines is commented out. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But once you've built this transform, when you call fit, you're actually building the model that can then be used to do the predictions. It really is as simple as that. There's a lot of IP goes into building that middle bit, but therein is you're capturing the essence of the model and the output, which is that zip file, is what comes out of this process. Next slide, please. Now you can go out and try this uh, yourself. The original one occasionally goes down for maintenance. We've got it on one of the free plans. So if it's been used a bit, you may not get as responsive as you want there. But well, there's the aka.ms link. And you can see here some screenshots I've did from two very short bits of script. Now, I'm not pretending that you want to be doing your estimates based on just one sentence. But even with this, and these were from films that we obviously not part of our uh, training model, it's making its prediction here. So the first one is my best friend's wedding. Um, and you can see that's a clear one in the original model 
were used. Um, and then on the right hand side, you've got the Lost Boys sentence, uh, um, and that is a horror, but it's got an element of humour, so it, you can see why it's uh, ranking on those. And we've got this nice initial star, so a big thanks to Jason uh, for coming up with that. So, next slide please, Robin. How did it all go? Because that, in essence, in that in this quick 10 minutes, I try to give you a feel for the entire process from coming up with the idea to writing the code in ml.net, testing it, deploying it and putting a nice UI. If it was up to me, I would have just had Postman or whatever, a new post, an API call, but we felt that we should put a nice front end on it. Well, actually pretty good. You know, it, it, we got up and going very, very quickly. Um, we did notice a slight tendency towards grouping lots of things in horror. And, and this is something we're going to come back to because this is really interesting. So, you know, on the plus side, easy to get up and going, not much .NET code needed. However, as you saw from that comment that I, you know, in the mod there, the only real way to sort of test your model is to comment code out, run it, take the output, re-comment the code, try something else. And I think that for Phil and I was the toughest bit is we didn't always get a sense of how good our model was and we don't have as many dials and knobs for tweaking and to be able to try the various things out and be sure it's the best. Now there is an auto ML capability in ML.net but still it's hard to get a real sense of how well the model's doing and to evolve it over time by doing regression testing and seeing the outputs the results. So this is the point that Robin and I got together and said, hey, if we were to bring a real data scientist into this process and handle that creation of the ML model, what would that look like? Would we get a much better output and a more rigorous process towards evaluating our whole model? And this is the point at which I hand over to Robin and he will take us through when given this challenge, what did he actually do? Thank you, David. Um, okay. okay. Oh, sorry, I've got a bit of an echo. So, David, do you mind muting? Thank you. Um, I've still got an echo, unfortunately. Um, so I'll continue. Okay. So, uh, with 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 the um, with the original concept, um, there were some issues. Um, so, I, I came along and I looked at uh, what the teams created, um, and yes, it looked like it was it was doing some predictions and stuff was coming out of it and you threw a film against it and it would evaluate that and give you a result and from the from the bits of text that we sent against it it looked like it was doing a reasonable job but um how can we evaluate that how can we understand the level of accuracy um it's giving us if we were going to put this into a real world um if, if into real world production, um, how could we say that it was going to do any good? It wasn't just going to fall flat on its face. How could we understand if there were any parts of it that um, were overfitted, underfitted? Um, so, so these, so these are the the, the kind of problems um, that we'd look to try and resolve uh, by putting it through a proper um, testing training split with the data. Um, there's also the problem that it's a bit of a black box solution as well so we can I mean we can say what algorithms we want to use um, but it's um, but we're limited to to a smaller number of alg algorithms than you would have in if you were using a language such as Python um, so that's a, a limitation um, so you might get to a point and not be able to go any further uh, with that um, and then understanding things like when you need to retrain it, if you don't know what accuracy you've got, you don't know if your accuracy is uh, decreasing with new data coming in. Um, and if you're not doing a test train split, how can you actually rely on if you did have an accuracy figure um, coming from uh, from your, your testing data? How how can you sorry from your training data? How can you understand if that if that is going to impact in the real world? So um, putting things into a, a standard data science life cycle. Um, and this was the kind of process we used really to to see to go through um, how we would do this using Python toolings um, and we're going to talk about that and we're going to talk about um, the methodologies involved and also how you go around doing a natural language processing classification of text as well and go a bit deeper into um, the, the, the kind of theory behind it as well. 
So um, with the data science process, you you have a start, you start with your business understanding, understand the problem you're trying to do, acquire data, deployment, new model, and you might jump around all of these as, as you get more insight into data, et cetera. Um, you'll have some fe feature engineering. You probably almost certainly have to do in a real world scenario. Um, feature engineering we've had to do is light in this because we are, the scripts weren't too bad um, and we're just taking the 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 words and um, wrangling them. So um, we don't really have problems with with null values or um, minority um, features or anything like that. It's just um, effectively dealing with those words. And again, we'll talk about uh, doing that as well. And then we do a deployment. And so we're going to talk about deployment as well. Um, we're not going to abandon ml.net. We're, we're going to we're going to use Python to do the, the heavy lifting and then we're going to come back to ml.net and we're going to deploy our Python models using ml.net and we'll show you a demo of that and show you how that works. So effectively, data science process, have a question to answer, pair the data, select the algorithm, train the model, test the model. So let's talk about um, this, this particular um, problem and um, talk about how the, the kind of considerations around it. So first of all, this is a natural processing uh, problem. So the kind of things we could do with natural processing, um, machine comprehension, so uh, Q&A, um, and we've recently um, released into preview um, a technology called semantic search as part of cognitive search, which lets you do that, throw your data at it, and we've taken the learnings from Bing and put them into there. We won't talk about that in this uh, session. We may talk about it in the in the Buffy one. Um, text creation, which if you're interested in text creation, come to the next one. Like I say, we're creating a new Buffy episode. Translation, voice to text, text to voice, text simplicity and sorry, understanding intent, document classification and text from image extraction. So really this is document classification we're looking at here. And um, so the first problem is um, what we're doing is we're taking text uh, which is quite subjective and we're putting it into categories which again are very subjective uh, categories and quite fluid in terms of um, it, what, what, what genre film can fall into. So you could argue over lots of different uh, film genres if they are, so for example Beetlejuice, is it a rom-com, is it a horror, spaceballs, is it sci-fi, is it a comedy? So um, so this is our first problem, the fact that um, the genre is very very loose um, so the thing we're trying to predict, the label we're trying to predict, isn't very, it's particularly set label. It's not like uh, a um, if we were going to say the what's the stock price going to be tomorrow? It's going to be a price, and we're going to get that right or wrong. And with this, we're kind of saying it's horror, but it actually, it might be a wrong com as well. So that's our first problem. Um, our second problem is is preparing the data. Uh, so first of all, text data isn't really great for um, sticking through an algorithm because an algorithm wants to understand everything as numbers. So what we, what do we do? We have to take our we have to take our words and we have to turn them into numbers. And then how we have to form a um, a way of understanding how those numbers are are special in for each particular document. So um, and we also have, as David said, we also have the problem of stop words. So things like and, the, that, those kind of words that actually don't really mean anything in terms of if we're trying to predict what the film's about. We, it doesn't matter that if someone says and a lot in it, it's not really going to change the genre. It's not going to really change anything. So moving the unimportant words, uh, do we do word stemming? So um, do we do things such as if someone's uh, run, running, ran, they're all the same kind of word. Do we under do we group words together? So um, do we say things like um, UK and London are grouped together, five and six are grouped together? Um, do we do things and try and understand the frequency of different words in text? So we're going to talk about these last two. Uh, well, in fact, we'll talk about all of these in, in a bit more detail as we go through the demo. So next problem, selecting the algorithm. Uh, so do we choose ML.NET algorithms or do we choose Python? So on the right here, we can see all the different algorithms that we have available to us in ML.NET, and it does it does a good job of those algorithms. But as I thought, it's not very extensible. You are limited um, in the kind of things that you can do, uh, and you're also limited um, in some of the more exciting, more experimental stuff that we have um, coming in Python. Um, and you're also limited when you come to deployment. 
um, and training. Uh, how are you going to train that data? Data if you have a, a massive amount of data. Say we had um, a petabyte's worth of data. ML.NET is probably not going to be the, the easiest language to, to train that data in, where something like Python, we could use PySpark, we could run across a cluster, and we could train that in quite a short amount of time. So Python does lend itself to bigger uh, data science problems and does lend itself to um, more extensibility, more algorithms, and um, all the new cool stuff coming out is, is basically landing in Python. Plus, we have lots of tools in Python to do things like model explainability, um, understanding fair learn, all of these kind of toolings. So, um, don't want to, but enjoy just in, in back on this. Don't want to devalue ML dot. It's really good tool. Uh, it's just it's not as extensible as Python. So when we come to training the model, um, so this was a problem with the original um, that there was the model was just trained and then released. Um, there was no test train split. So how do we know that the, that model? How do we know the accuracy of the model? If we had the accuracy of the model, do we know that that model was it was um, was going to be overfitted or underfitted? So for example, it might just be really good at, at predicting the things that it's been told, the films that it's been told. But when it comes to a new film, it might fall over completely. Um, so this is why we do the test train split so we can test the model with some data, hold some data back that it's never seen before and then throw that data at it that it's never seen before to see how it might operate in the real world um, and that the model's not overfitted i.e. it's only good at predicting the data that it, it has been trained on or it's not underfitted um, whereas it's um, it's too simplistic and it doesn't really give it any a good um, a level of accuracy. So and with any machine learning, the kind of correct way is in the middle. You never expect machine learning to be 100% accurate. Um, so, um, but you want to get, you know, usually for a pretty good level of accuracy in, in the kind of 80s is usually good, depending on the problem, that is. Um, and then how do we understand the understand the model? Um, again, this uh, in, the, in the .NET version um, wasn't really any uh, accuracy around it so um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to when we come to the Python we'll break down we'll look at the accuracy um, and and understand how how that works and then if we go, went further we might look at recall and precision um, to understand if we're getting all of the um, films that we want um, and if we how good we are at predicting them okay so that's the that's the basics so let's move on to showing you some actual code. Now, um, everything I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be doing in uh, Azure Machine Learning. Um, now, however, the, the Python I'm running is just open source Python. What we do with Azure Machine Learning is we give you a platform to run the Python on. And uh, we, you can also use it to record your experiments. You can use it to um, supply compute. In fact, I'll just show you. I'm not going to spend too long talking about Azure Machine Learning. Um, I really just want to get to the theory of what we're doing. But I've I've got uh, um, got the ability in here to create different types of compute. This can be a compute um, that's really cheap compute if I wanted. That can take me down to just running um, at seven cents an hour, or I could go up to run GPUs and um, see we've got a different size uh, NVIDIA machines here um, that I could then use for doing so for example it's a four times NVIDIA Tesla M60 on this machine um, so a bit more expensive but you know still if you're if if you're only going to run it for an hour or two that's not that much that bad um, and so we can so we can create a new uh, uh, machine learning compute Here's one I'm actually running at the moment. Yeah, so leave that. I'm actually running a GPU here already. So this is what I'm going to be running my notebooks on. Um, and I'll come. I might come back and talk about some other scene, other bits here as we go through. But let's jump into our notebook. So this is notebooks. You integrate. You can integrate this into Git, um, which I have done for the romcom. I haven't exposed it yet though. So, um, so in the rom romcom, I have in here um, all the scripts. Uh, which you, maybe I wouldn't if this was production, maybe I wouldn't put all the scripts in the same folder as here. I'd actually maybe put them onto a data lake and draw them up from data lake, but uh, we'll keep things simple and put them actually within the folder structure. And then I have some um, uh, Jupyter notebooks um, and I can run Jupyter notebooks in here, but if 
I can also run them as part of a um, in here as well. Um, so we're going to run it in here just it's a bit it's a bit clearer to um, look at it. OK, so um, let's not run this one first. Let's run this one first. So um, let's just make sure our cluster's running. Yes, good. OK, so uh, in terms of the environment, um, first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to connect to my workspace. So this is my Azure machine. In fact, let's pop this out for the moment so I can see if I jump around without closing anything. So this is my Azure machine learning workspace. This is going to let me go in, record experiments and all the stuff that I'm doing. Um, so I've got a log of everything um, and I can go back. Um, so we do our general imports, all the kind of standard stuff, NumPy, um, uh, pandas, all this kind of thing, I'm able to, build, to plot. And then we define a data label here. So these are the, the, the genres that we're going to try and predict. So that's rom com, horror, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we're going to load in our scripts. So I've just created a little function. All I'm doing here is I'm just basically doing um, just opening the file location, looping through each file. Um, so if it's a text file, bring it in, um, put it in as raw text, take that raw text, put it into a data frame, and I'll also rip the uh, label from the file names. If you remember, David said that um, when we had the file names and we put them out, we put the label uh, of what they are as the first character. So things like heist is a three, four is a um, comedy, five I think is a horror, no, five is sci-fi. So um, bring that out and that gives basically will give us a uh, so we run that and that will basically give us a um, let's just bring that in um, and do a head on that just show you what it looks like. So this gives us a data frame um, where we have the label for this first one it's a one um, which I think is a rom-com and then we have the text of it um, and I don't know which rom-com this is but it's a rom-com. So uh, first thing we do, like I said before, we need to think about um, what we're doing with the text because we can't just throw text uh, a machine learning algorithm. It needs to, it can only understand numbers. So we need to do word embeddings. So what we mean by um, word embeddings is we're going to convert that text into something a bit more uh, useful. And there are different techniques to do that, and I'm going to talk about a few of them. Um, in this case, the first one that we're doing is we're doing uh, count vector vectorizer, which also uh, you might have heard as one hot encoding. So what we do with one hot encoding is we take all of the um, take all the words and we put each word into its own column, and then we record how many times that word occurs in that document. So we end up with a very, very, very long data frame uh, with all the different words in it. Um, so in this case, um, uh, in fact, I'll show you this. I'll show you this one. Um, so we run. Um, so we've got four sentences here. Microsoft, a great public cloud called Azure. Azure is a cloud technology. Um, you can read the rest. So we take them. We run the, um, uh, the the vectorizer on that, and this will output um, this type of uh, grid. So we see the first sentence um, Azure called. These are the words in the first sentence. We see the I did have also, OK, maybe not this one. Um, and we also see the, um, yeah, OK, that's put down. Um, and we can also see the, uh, the the frequency of the thing. So uh, learning was in our third sentence, machine learning. This is, you can run machine learning on Azure. This is machine learning, so machine is twice, learning is twice. So we have a frequency now. We have all the words. We have frequency of those words. So we can use this um, to start doing, um, running through algorithms and start um, understanding a bit more about the document um, uh, through the algorithm to try and do predictions. However, um, if we want to understand the difference between these, it's, I mean, we've got a count of where things are, it's, but it's, there, are, there are more techniques that we can use. So um, a pretty common technique is the term frequency times inverse document frequency, TFIDF, which uh, is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but what we're doing here is we're working out how relevant each word is to a document. So for example, in, this, um, in these three sentences, machine learning actually only appears in the second sentence. So um, in fact, let's take learning. So learning only appears in the second sentence. So learning is very important to this, this type of document um, because it only appears here. So if we start thinking about our 
um, films, it might be something like laser might only be appearing in science fiction films. We might have scream as only appearing in horror films, things like this. And so we're trying to go through, we're trying to identify what it is that makes um, what makes it unique, these what what makes these words unique to these films. So I mean it's quite a simplistic um, process, um, but it works quite well. So we run the um, the the the, the the term frequency terms in first document frequency against this. And we end up with this kind of pattern um, and I've put it into a, a um, heat map so we can see it a bit better. So as you can see that sentence three, um, these are very strongly um, reference sentence three. So if this was type three, if this was the label was sentence three, we would be able to predict more sentence threes just by the fact it had machine and learning in it. OK, so this is supervised learning. Uh, I won't bother going through all different types of learning, but effectively this is supervised learning classification um, and it's a multi-class classification because we are trying to predict one of five things. So we can start going through and looking at some of the standard um, techniques that we might use. So um, I usually start off looking at something like naive Bayes. So naive Bayes, pretty simple um, classification. Um, and we go, we go through, we do the count vectorizer. We, um, we, we, so we run that text with the count vectorizer and then we run our TFIDF against that. Train a model using naive plays and then run predictions. So in doing this, we can see we actually get a reasonable accuracy. Now this is an accuracy based on the uh, training data, not the testing data. So um, we're not really doing a full data science process here, um, but we get about 78, 79% um, accuracy. Um, what that would look like if we gave it testing data, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Um, so there's a few bits of chunk of code here. So what we do is we're going to go through and we create a training pipeline. So the training pipeline is basically taking those chunks of code and it's putting them into a much more manageable thing. So we account vectorize a TIDF um, and then our actual naive base. And here I'm actually using Azure Machine Learning. So when I'm running my experiment, I'm tagging it. So I'm creating, I'm saying this is an experiment. This is stuff to run. I'm tagging that it's a, a, um, a naive base um, experiment. And then I run the experiment as that creates pipeline. I fit the pipeline. I run the predictions and then I output the results to Azure Machine Learning and I then output a chart. So let's just jump back to this to show you what it looks like. So I have my experiments in here. Experiments, experiments, I've lost them. There they are. So in my experiments, um, classification, I can see that um, these are all the iterations. I've done this, run this quite a few times. I can see all the iterations that I've done. I can see how good they are in terms of their accuracy. So um, and we'll come to this in a bit. So I can see that um, I've got some that are pretty accurate, some that are actually pretty poor. Um, and I can go into each individual ones and I can look at them and I can look at the things that I've recorded against them. So I can see my results that came out of um, the testing, the actual testing data, the actual training data. I can look at the, like, the metrics I put in there, the images. So these are um, the results I, I brought out from this one. If I'd wanted to, I could also create snapshots so I could have a copy of the code in here. If in case I'd gone off and I'd messed with the code, I've forgotten what I was doing. I can also have explanations of, the, of it, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to dwell too much on this. I'm um, going to go through more of the data science um, aspect of here, but just letting you know that we're using Azure Machine Learning. We're using that to record experiments and it gives us the ability to be able to run back into um, previous experiments just to see how well we're doing as we change around all different kind of things. So we run this. Um, so our training data uh, was 79% 70, accurate, but if we put this out into the real world and it saw new things that had never been tested against, it would only have 20% accuracy. So not that great. And as you can see, it's all a bit muddled. So this is showing you all the genres for each of the films. I'm sorry, it's a bit small. Um, so we have uh, in there, we have um, really the matrix. So as you can see, it's it thinks the matrix is a sci-fi, which is correct, but it's also a bit confused. All these other ones, it thinks maybe it's a, maybe it's also a um, horror as well, which I guess a little bit is, but there you go. Um, and then just visualization there. Um, so that was good, but we didn't have any stop words in it. So we're going to go and get some stop words. So we get the stop words, and um, basically there's this um, with um, the library. You can go and download the stop words and stick them in. 
Um, so for example, this is um, take number film 33. This is babe. Um, so we can see pig, sheep, hoggart, and but as we go down, um, oh, I've already run the stop words on that one. Nah. Not good, is it? Because I, yeah, okay. So I've already run stop words on that one. There would have been if uh, that in here, um, and we see it, we move those stop words. So we just get the words that are relevant to the actual film. So as you can see, these are now words that are more relevant to the film. Um, yes. So I could run again, but it, it, the main words coming up at the top with that and things like that. Okay, so we're running with the stop words. We run this off, and um, in taking out the stop words, we get much better accuracy. So we get 50% accuracy. So on our test training data, we get 100%, but that's you know not not relevant reflective of the real world. So we run it on testing data that's never seen before. We get 50%, and we start to see um, it's still all a bit muddled, but we know that we're actually um, getting better results from this. Uh, we talked about overfitting. So next, we'll do a random forest. So with our random forest, um, again, same kind of process. We're still recording it against Azure Machine Learning. We're running the pipeline. Within the pipeline, we're saying stop words. When we're creating an experiment, we're telling it not to snapshot it. If I turn this off, if I remove this line, it would actually copy all the code I have in that folder and put it into the experiment that I could, so I could go back there. We can also record models back against the experiment and see which experiments um, create which models, download the models from it, et cetera. Um, I'm keeping things simple at the moment. So random forest, let's see how that does. Again, still 50%, um, still a bit muddled. Um, some things are quite clear. So Star Wars is starting to come out very much as sci-fi. Um, now we try a neural network. Um, so this isn't a deep neural network yet. We will do a deep neural network in a bit. Um, so we do a deep neural network. Go through and we can see it's getting better all the time. So 60% accuracy and we can start to see it's, it's splitting quite well between. So Star Wars, it's very confident that's a sci-fi. Um, we see um, Nightmare on Elm Street, very confident that's a horror. So starting to see a much cleaner split of the data. Um, so things are getting better. Then we're going to try a, a support vector machine. So how a support vector machine works is um, while a, a, a neural network, it tries to um, categorize the things out by drawing uh, complex boundaries around all the different items. A support vector machine draws, draws a straight line, changes dimensionality of the actual um, data. So for example, um, if we I'm doing this bit in R, um, so for example, if we had this data and we want to use support vector machine, we'd want to draw a straight line through it. You can't really draw a straight line through that data. So what we would do is we'd add a level of dimensionality to it. And um, one second. Yeah, so we would so we'd have this data, we'd add a level of dimensionality to it, and so we'd make it 3D, and once it's 3D, we could draw a line through it. Easy to show, 2D to 3D, not very easy to show 3D to 4D, or et cetera. Um, so that's what we're doing, support vector machine. Uh, pretty simple, really, just drawing a straight line, but changing the, the data behind it to be able to do that. So, um, so we can end up with 50% accuracy, still a bit muddled in there. Um, but there's other techniques we can do is I'm not going to run this, takes four minutes, <laughs> leave myself a note for there. Um, what we we can also go through and we can um, create a grid search. So basically this is going to go through and look at all the different um, parameters that we can change. So the alpha, the loss, the penalty, the L1 ratio, uh, and it's going to run through all these different combinations to try and work out the best model. So we run through that and we uh, try and get the best model. And we get well, still still 50% accuracy. We I have actually got a bit better than that before. Um, and we're getting stronger, um, it's, it's clearer um, uh, uh, um, labeling in here. So um, so let's say we were happy with what we've got. We might take that and we might turn that into an onyx. So it's pretty simple here. So psychic learn to onyx is the library I'm using. I'm just taking my um, now modified um, uh, SVN um, uh, file and I'm just pushing that out into an onyx. So we run that, uh, serialize string, push it out. And once we have an onyx file, onyx files can um, basically you can use them in, in, in lots and lots of different places. So Onyx is a standard that we've been developing with Facebook since uh, 2017. Um, it's designed to run on multiple platforms, um, anywhere that you can run the Onyx runtime, which is, is flexible uh, in terms of you can run it on, on pretty much anything. So you can run it on your phone, you could run it on a, a, a Linux box, um, you can run it in .NET, you can run it on 
whatever you want it in Python. So, um, so we take that file and we push it out. Um, and let me just show you what that looks like if we take that and put it into and use that in combination with ml.net. So if we were doing this, we wanted to operationalize it. We might do it with ml.net um, because we might have a, a .NET application. So we want to that we want to put it in. So we've done all the training, we've done all the heavy stuff in uh, Python, come out, do it in here. So what are we doing in here? Um, we are basically put, got our model um, in here somewhere. So that's my model on X. Um, and I will basically just take that and I will go through and let me show you where that's put in. Um, and so we just do Onyx um, prediction pipeline. And so we'll take that model and we'll run the predictions. And remember, this is a model that's been trained in Python that we've just moved into using in a um, ML.NET. And because we've trained it in Python, we can we can create use any kind of um, technology behind it to create that model. Uh, and and the, the the Onyx platform basically lets uh, ML.NET be able to interpret the um, what that model is and be able to throw data through it and run predictions. So what are we doing here? We are going to go through and we're going to run through all the scripts I have in my um, C drive. So it's quite quite a substantial number of scripts in here, and we're going to loop through all those scripts and we're going to run a prediction against them. Uh, just see how quickly that runs. So I'll kick that off, and I bet it pops up on the other screen, which it does. Let's get it, of course, there quickly. And as you can see, um, it's running through all the scripts, running predictions. As you can see, pretty quick in in terms of what it's doing. Um, so this is the the SVN model that we created, uh, and we already know that it's it's pretty good at running predictions. So that was predicted type four, and this was a four. That's predicted. Um, so that was much Python Holy Grail. Hot Fuzz was another comedy. It predicted that correctly, um, but I also put this in time taken 22 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, 20 minutes milliseconds. So extremely fast to run predictions um, using Onyx in ML.net. So that's one way of, of, of operationalizing and thought we'd put that in because the, ho the whole concept behind the original was um, ML.net. Um, so other things that we could do, we could also, if we weren't happy going through looking at all the different algorithms, etc. Um, we could use AutoML. Uh, with AutoML, we can we can basically call, call a package, go through, and push out a um, run through lots and lots of iterations. Um, and so we don't need to worry too much about the um, science behind it because it does it all for us. So if I go to my experiments, I can go through and I can look at my AutoML experiment, and it will have gone through and it will have run lots and lots and lots of different iterations for me i think i probably told it to do um create 80 different iterations and as as you can see it's run through lots of things and it's come up with as light gbm as um giving us an accuracy of 77 percent it also has things like data guardrail so it will go in it'll make sure everything's balanced it will do our featureization for us uh, and all those kind of things that we're having to do um in the uh, as, you, as you source through code so makes it um, very easy. And we can also take this, say that we wanted this model, we could also take this model out um, and we could, um, we can bring it out as a pickle file, but we also have an option in here to out to, with AutoML to output the uh, models as Onyx. So we could just take, run AutoML, bring the model out, stick it into ML.net. So uh, I'm just gonna briefly, I appreciate I'm starting to run out of time. So I'm just gonna briefly go through, um, the other things we did, so we also created a, a neural network. With our neural network, uh, we went through and um, did all the kind of basic steps that we'd done before. Um, actually, let's just get down to the, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong one. Um, let's get down to the actual neural network. So this is what happens if uh, with the AutoML, it's kind of how you get to see. Uh, so with the neural network, we ran through um and we got an accuracy of seven so we did the stop words we we constructed a um deep neural network where is that where is it and oh sorry no what am i talking about this is going through this is is outputting the auto ml so that was the auto ml so this we're getting the best uh run from the auto ml taking that auto ml uh we output it as a pickle file running that so we get accuracy of um 70 percent with the auto ml then we could try a deep neural networks so with deep neural network. Basically, we're just using Keras, um, keeping it nice and simple, um, constructing a deep neural 
click on that, uh, constructing a deep neural network. So um, we have multiple dense layers here. Um, and we run through this and we went through um, 20 iterations of our deep neural network to give us a output that as a model accuracy that gave us um, accuracy of uh, 60 percent and as you can see it's very clear in terms of the things it thinks are one or the other so, so it's you know it's a nightmare on elm street absolutely positive that's a holler same neat neural network added more layers to it run it through again um and we get an output of um uh, again, uh, yeah, so there we get an output of 70%. So we kind of rival using deep neural network, we're kind of rivaling now the AutoML. So we know that we AutoML um, has done a really good job. We know 70% is about the target that we're looking for, and we can um, kind of develop our deep neural networks to do that. But um, again, just uh, yeah, pretty simple, just using Keras and doing the same things that we were doing with us, uh, kind of classic machine learning, removing the stop words, doing the word encoding, uh, doing the, the, the frequency of the words running through that okay so i was going to show you word to vec um but i don't really have time i'll just give you a brief overview of word to vec uh so word to vec basically um so we're looking at the frequency of words but word to vec looks at the association so within this uh, this i took star wars and i can say with word to vec tell me all the words associated with stars so we can still say death moon chosen planet um and then we can group those words together as you can see we this is um this is our, our words and how they group together. Um, and we can see, um, so here's a grouping of certain words, a, a group, so rebellion, dangerous, several, senate, those are the thing kind of words it, it used together. So we used word to vec and we trained a model. Um, and as you can see, um, training data actually got percent and we got about 57%, but there's probably tweak this a bit. Um, this was a bit of a experiment. Um, but as you can see, uh, we, we can go through and just using a different technique, just clustering the words together. Right, so let's um, jump across back to you, David. Wow, thank you. So <laughs> as you can see, compared with the work that Phil and I did, Robin has got a lot deeper into this, looked at all sorts of different algorithms and has a much higher level of confidence in the model he's produced. So what I wanted to do was in spirit, as Robin said, with the keeping of the original one, which was to explore ML the .NET platform, I effectively wanted to create a .NET sandwich in which the middle part of the sandwich, the meaty bit there, is the uh, model that Robin is a data scientist producer. And what I want to wrap it is with the love of .NET, both at the front end and at the back end. So at the back end there on the right hand side, I've created an Azure function, and I'm going to be using that to do that predict you saw um, Robin do. Uh, I'm going to be taking the zip file that's come out from that Onyx process there. Now I chose functions because uh, serverless is a, is, a, is a great model, a lot of interest in it from both an architectural and a costing perspective because we offer uh, consumption based pricing which means you only pay for it being used and an HTTP trigger is one of a number of different mechanisms available so it's a great model for being able to um, take some input such as a script, run the model, get the results and throw that back out and then go back to sleep um, you know, until the next call comes in. And on the client side, what I wanted to do is rather than use the JavaScript stuff, I wanted to explore something else that's new in the .NET world, uh, Blazor. Now, if you've not come across this, um, it makes use of the fact that all the modern browsers these days support so something called WebAssembly, uh, and that's a sort of low level assembly like language that can execute in the desktop browser in a safe environment. What we do is I, we have a way of taking that .NET code and making it run in the WebAssembly. So you can again take the code that you're used to and instead of having to learn JavaScript, go and actually build your logic in uh, the browser desktop side. So this is really good for SPA, single page applications um, and both of these projects are live still going through their final iterations but i put the links to the github project there and we'll post that in the side window um, next slide please robin
So how does that look under the cover? So on the right hand side for the Azure functions, really, really easy. And it's exactly the same code you saw earlier. We create a prediction pool, which is a set of pooled resources of these models. So when we start up the function, we grab the rom-com model and we grab it from a URI. So I've actually in my GitHub project included one of the early models that Robin gave me and I pull it directly from GitHub as a zip file down into the code. And then in the bottom right, um, you can see the little arrow pointing to the final line there, predict, where I take the text we've been given and posted via the HTTP webhook, and then I process it, throw it at the engine, get the results back and return it as a JSON string for each of the five types back to the browser. On the left hand side, if you've not come across Blazor, it's, it's really great in a couple of ways. Firstly, as a .NET developer, you can immediately get up and going. But also, um, the two sections you see on the left hand side are both in the same file. So what it does is allow you to mix both HTML and code together and cross reference between the two of them, which it then compiles down to a class as part of your .NET .NET code. So you can see in the very top line in the top left corner there, I'm declaring an HTML a button, but the on click is pushing down to some C sharp code that's in the script part of the file. That's the code that then makes the call to the back end Azure function, gets the return value and puts it into genre output, a C sharp variable. Then back up at the top left corner, I then use a for each construct. So again, I, that feels really good as a C sharp programmer to iterate through each of the, in this case, five results I'll get back and pull out um, the model type, the genre type and the probability and display it. And then mixing through the style, you can see here HTML with C sharp code. And I, I've got to be honest, at first it took a while for me to get my head round it. I was used to thinking about manipulating div classes and trying to manipulate that. And then I had to sort of let go and go, breathe in, no, no, think about it. I just iterate through it, I mix code and HTML. And once you get your head around it, it's it's a really nice way of working. Um, and so and it, it feels very natural. Next slide and final bit for my one here. So it's up and live. There's the URL. I was testing it earlier. It, it should be on there. You can feed some stuff in there. Get slightly different results to what we got before. And that's you know a sign of the fact that this script the same as I saw earlier from my best friend's wedding there. So it is clearly a rom-com, but it has more um, elements of the other ones that suggest we've perhaps done a, a, a deeper analysis of what's going on. Um, so that's the UI. It looks and feels the same, though I put a check script button because one bit of feedback we did get from the first one is you're not sure whether you're meant to do something or not. So I like the idea of a button. Um, and again, the source code is up there. And we deploy that through Azure Static Web Apps. Uh, at the moment, it's two separate projects, but we're going to bring it together. And if you've not come across these, they are really cool. They're still in preview at the moment. And if you think about it, traditionally in the web development world, for a traditional web server, you make an HTTP request and all the processing executes server side and the output from that is streamed down to the desktop, into the browser where the user does some interactions and then posts back and you get caught in that loop. These days, um, the trend is more towards single page applications where the web server is simply delivering the SPA content down to the browser and all the action happens there. So it's a lovely, more interactive, more distributed model here. So Azure Static Web Apps are fantastic for being proper web servers, but they don't do server side rendering. They simply push uh, the content down to the desktop, to the browser there. But also for those jQuery style calls, they wire up an Azure function at the back end automatically so that you can then hook the results back in. So you can see for us, this is absolutely fabulous. Deploy the Blazor app. When you press that check script button, it wires up the call straight to the Azure function, grabs the model, does the prediction, returns the results back. And what's even better about static web apps is the fact that it does the full DevOps cycle. So it does a, uh, you know, 
CICD deployment through GitHub action. So every time you commit back against GitHub, it runs the build process, uh, actually lets you see that thing. And if it's a successful build, it deploys it automatically out. So we, my experience has been lots of people want slick DevOps, but sometimes the extra effort to make it work can be hard. But here, when you create your static web app, it creates the YAML for you. You can go in obviously and tweak and tune it and does everything you need to actually keep that in sync. And the link between the two is Robin's uh, zip file, the Onyx file that contains the model. So effectively, as the output from that data science process, Robin creates that file that's then fed into my system and we have a ready-made app ready to go. And if there may be that some of you have actually tried it out there using that romcom d2 link. So that's me done for my bit. Uh, Robin, we've got a couple of questions that are in um, the chat. You, in the last moments, perhaps you might want to quickly make any quick comments on them. I'm not sure whether you've had time to have a look yeah, at them. Yeah. Okay, so, okay there was, so there was there was one there question. Was one question. Um, sorry, I've got a bit of an echo. Um, so there was one, qu one qu question. Is anyone else seeing any echo? echo? Or is it just me? Oh, I'll me switch for in case it's me. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so there's one question about how do we choose a model? Um, so normally I would just you run AutoML. Um, AutoML will give me a good idea of, of what is achievable and um, also give me a good idea of what models work. But then I would probably also just run through all the classic um, machine learning models such as um, Spot Vector Machine, Neural Network, Naive Bayes, Decision Tree, all of those kind of things and just see if any of them particularly lent themselves to um, doing it better. I'd also probably use AutoML as the, my baseline of what was a good um, good level of accuracy. It might be I might also go down to using a deep neural network, um, which I did in this case, just to just to see because that just to see if I can you get that to get to a, a higher level actually than uh, classic machine learning algorithms as well. It just it depends very much on the data that we've got through and the amount of data got through, going through. But in in this particular um, project, uh, the deep neural network, uh, as you saw, so AutoML was about 70% accurate and we got the deep neural network about 70% accurate. So um, if we spent a bit more time on, on the, the DNN, we could potentially have got that uh, to a higher level of accuracy. Um, we also do have the ability to do DNNs in AutoML as well. I hadn't turned that on for this one, but then that that's something that we could we could also try and see if we can in, improve accuracy in that respect. Um, yeah, and and like I say, we we started to look at some other techniques such as word word to vec um, and things like that. Um, and again, I, we played around a bit more. We could probably get uh, that to a higher level of accuracy. This was um, we didn't really go through too much in terms of um, the, we didn't go too much in terms of feature engineering, so there might be some stuff in the in in the files that we could do in addition to the stock words. We didn't go too much into hyperparameter tuning. Um, we were just most of the time we were just taking the base models. Um, okay, so I'm just, just looking down. Any other questions? Uh, so I think there is um, one for you. Oh, David, you've already answered that. Um, OK, so we are at time. Um, so yes, remember uh, next week we're going to be creating a new Buffy Vampire Slayer episode um, and talking about text generation. We'll talk about deep neural networks. We'll talking about LSTM networks, um, et cetera, and, and how they work in relation to being able to create data. We'll also talk about some of the other um, machine learning services um, and how we might use them to um, be able to identify uh, stuff around basically um, Slayer series. Um, so please do come along to that one as well. Um, so final final thoughts, words, David? No, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been a fantastic experiment. It's been great fun working together on this uh, project. And the nice thing is it's something that most people can relate to um, the whole, this whole idea of can you predict a genre of movie from an arbitrary chunk of text? So it's been, it's been great fun doing it as well. And given I love films, a great excuse to indulge uh, two great passions here. <laughs> Okay.
OK, so uh, if there are no more questions, um, we'll close off the meeting. Great, Robin and David, thank you so much for today. Um, it's been brilliant. Can't wait for next week's session as well. I've dropped the link in there to everyone um, so you can you can register now um, and hope to see you all there next week. Thank you so much.